بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا Thank you for all for coming. Um, probably I don't know many many of you probably don't know, but uh, about three years ago I released the fifth year project, which is called Meetings with Mountains, and um, it was really to introduce the, the faces of many people I've heard many of our scholars and Shayuk speak about, but I never, I always wanted to know what they look like. I, I hate to hear all these names like Haddad and Sakaaf and Haddad and Atas, but I never, I wanted to know what they look like. And as a, as a photographer, I took it on to give a face to the names because I'm a very visual person, I always have been. And um, I think the youth of today are particularly very visually orientated. And I wanted a way for them to connect with these amazing people so that they could relate to them. Um, I always wanted in, in um, Meetings with Mountains to have some of the biographies of some of the people featured in the, in the, in the book and not written by me, written by scholars who knew them. But the book became too big and uh, it just, it just became impossible. And so uh, I think Michael Sugic was having a similar uh, idea about, um, you know, doing a project really talking about these people as role models um, for the youth of today. Um, I know that when I was young, a long time ago, but, you know, my heroes were musicians and all kinds of people. And I know young people have similar role models, footballers and things. But, you know, really to take somebody as a role model, you need to know a lot about them. And uh, they may be a good musician, they may be a good footballer, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're a, a good role model. We need to know what our, how our role models treat their wives and how they treat children and how they what they think about the planet and all kinds of things. Are they morally or in our youth are going to take them as role models? So Michael was having a similar idea and we decided to do it as a separate project. And um, it was meant to be a year project and then COVID happened. And of course, um, it took much longer than we planned. And the idea wasn't, I, my job was just to really source the pictures. Uh, Michael's job was the picture editor and also to source writers. And this was very important part of it because you can know about somebody's life, but it's not enough to say they were a good person or no, they were a nice person. You need to be able to tell stories, explain why that is true. And you need to be able to really able to write. And that was really important for us to, to find writers that knew these people and could tell these stories. So this is how um exemplars for our time evolved we originally had a long list of about 20 people we wanted to feature and uh, but it became very difficult a to find writers that knew enough about them so anyway it got it got whittled down to we actually feature eight different people and there's one introductory really explaining about uh, exemplars and their lives and the need for them and about women saints and all these things um, each of the people featured are, they've all passed. That's part of why they, they need to be somebody whose life, their book is closed as far as this world is concerned. So we haven't featured anybody that's alive today. They are people that have lived in the last 150 years and the books are really telling their stories. So by their stories and by their lives, you can be understand what kind of, what kind of life they had. So. I'm going to give you a presentation. It's a visual presentation, and then we can have a discussion. Can we can we get rid of the lights now? Bismillah. Bismillah. Have you ever seen a face in a crowd or on the street that took your breath away? A face so full of inner light. Sorry. This is going too quickly for me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> OK. 
Okay. Okay. Smile. Have you ever seen a face in the crowd or on the street that took your breath away? A face so full of inner light that you felt a deep spiritual connection with that person? Or you, have you ever sat quietly with someone and slowly became aware that they have an incredible stillness emanating from their heart? Or have you ever sat talking with someone and suddenly they say something and it feels like God spoke directly to your heart? This is that journey. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, O oh God, guide me to the one who can guide me to you and open for me the doors of knowledge of you. We invite you today to join us in the search for every pious saint and those who have walked in their footsteps. Habib Ali Jifri said uh, when we launched Meetings with Mountains that by looking and meditating on the faces of the saints and sages, you begin to enter into their presence. This was Sheikh Muhammad Iqbal Abbasi, the one who swept our prophet's grave, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was allowed for 10 years into the, the sacred chamber to, to keep it clean uh, until the, uh, the, the uh, people stopped this uh, uh, process. Uh, pr process. Uh, Sheikh Murabat al-Hajj, uh, I called him the mountain in the desert. He was uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf's Sheikh, and he was a man of incredible presence. The ambassador of peace, Maulana Wahidin Khan from India. And I want you to enjoy these faces because these are not the usual faces. They're not what modern society would call beauty, but there's a majesty in these faces. The hidden one, Sheikh Mohammed Abu Bakr from Eritrea. Sheikh Mohammed Ridwan from South Egypt. He had a very clear light. The blind retired lumberjack who fell for God, Sili Ali, Fakir and constant servant of the Zawiyah of Sidi Muhammad ibn Habib. Sidi Muhammad Habib said, For the greatest of saints, there is neither action nor being other than the being and action of, of their Lord. The Damascene Quran teacher, Sheikh Abu Hassan Muhyiddin al-Kurdi, and never photographed before. O oh God, vouchsafe us your love and keep us in the company of the ones you love. Where do you find the saints and sages? Saints and sages are hidden, but can be found in every country and every culture. Some are known and many are unknown. In Istanbul, Turkey, Muzaffar Zak sold books from a small bookshop from a small bookshop. In a small town in western China, I noticed this man hidden in the crowd. In Lanzhou, a busy city in central China, the Imam laughed as I took his portrait, and I was glad that he did. And in a remote part of eastern China, this imam 
had cared for his community for 50 years. I have been told that the last saint on earth will be a Chinese man. Muli Hashem came from three generations of spiritual adepts, a humble and successful Moroccan businessman who even owned a patisserie shop. He always assured us that the path to God was easy. Muli Hassan was an anonymous man with a large family who crocheted simple woolen hats for a living, which he sold for a few dirhams. He said that this was not the making of the hats was not how he earned his living, but the making of the hats was his the shaking of the date palm, and from that dates fell and his provision was provided for. This Imam lived in a rose growing region in the desert of South Morocco. He owned an old rusty and dusty Cadillac, but preferred to ride his horse to the mosque. Sheikh Ahmed Fao was a great scholar hidden in the desert of Mauritania who lived with all his books in a tent. Hajanwar Mansur was a director of a large girls' school in the jungles of Indonesia. And Abdullah was a gatekeeper on a building site in Medina in Saudi Arabia. In later years, I would see him wandering around Medina with his bag of sweets, giving sweets to the people that he chose to gave, give them to. Sufi Abdullah Khan was a captured soldier during World War II, and in peacetime, he worked in a steel foundry near Birmingham, fasting during the day and praying at night. Where are the female exemplars? We were always told, the men are hard to find, but the women are even more hidden. It is rare to find, at this time, a female teacher whom men visit and take guidance. Although she never accepted men as her followers, this female saint, Seda Fatima Ayushratiya, was extremely well respected and lived through a very turbulent time in the Levant. In Turkmenistan, this saintly woman served the tomb of Sheikh Yusuf al Hamdani for 60 years. The wives of Sidi Mabin and Habib served us food and drinks whenever we visited his Zawiya. They knew us, but we never saw or knew them until much later. They were the hidden exemplars of the Zawiya and their lives were in the service of others. In Multan, the city of saints in Pakistan, as I sat in a car waiting for my colleagues to arrive, I was drawn to this unique woman, invisible to the people around her. By reading about the lives of the saints and sages of God, we can discover wisdoms and guidance for our own lives. By looking at their outward forms, you can see the beauty of their spirituality. This is Sidi Muhammad ibn Habib in his 50s. And then in his late 90s, he was still active and still traveling. And finally, over 100 years old, he was still teaching during Ramadan and he passed away on his way to perform the following Hajj. Habib Ahmed Mashul Haddad, around the age of 18, already an advanced student on the path. In his mid-twenties, he attracted love from all who were graced by meeting him.
In middle age, he continued to travel, spreading the peaceful message of Islam, even in remote villages in Africa. And during his last stage of life, he emanated a peace and compassion that was undeniable. Sitting in, sitting in the company of these exemplars can transform your life. Habib Omar Samait was one of the people who transformed Habib Ahmed's life. And also the life of exemplar Sayyid Umar Abdullah. Muhammad Ali, who was gifted with deep knowledge of astronomy, spent his life with Sheikh Murabat al Hajj. Farid is proof of keeping good company. He spent his life with the Habib of Hadramod. Michael Sugij says in the introduction to the Exemplar series. Companionship with learned sages and people of wisdom is more important than ever in a global society that is increasingly fractured, profane and distressed. Even sharing what I call a bowl of organic water with the saints of Mauritania is keeping company. Or sitting outside the house of the great saint Habib Saleh on the island of Lamu in Kenya. Every minute you spend with your teachers is priceless as it enhances the time you sit alone with God. Our lives are passing quickly. Ultimately, this journey we are all on is about the heart. Sidi Muhammad ibn Habib said in his Diwan, Dear God, you are what I seek, my refuge from wrong and from injustice and deceit. You are my hope in answering my needs. You are the one who will save me from evil and harm. May blessings be upon the Prophet and his family and companions and those who have shown his way. I would like now to introduce you briefly the nine monographs. Sidi Michael Sugic wrote the very important introduction to the Exemplar series, which features on the cover the beautiful face of the saint Sheikh Abdul Shakur Ajilani. At the age of 80 or 90, uh, Sheikh Abdul Shakur became very ill, but they thought that he was going to die. And then he recovered and lived to be over 150 years old. Michael says in the introduction, we have never before been so in need of spiritual exemplars, role models who can inspire us and guide us through their wisdom, purify beautiful qualities of character, sublime actions, deep insight and right guidance in these confusing and troubled times. He goes on to say, there is also something subtle, almost imperceptible, something rare and precious, that is the absence of ego. Michael also researched and wrote about the life of Sidi Muhammad ibn Habib, born in 1871 in Fez. In 1936, he established his second Zawaya, this time in Meknes, as a place for learning and teaching the practices leading to the purification of the heart and knowledge of God. He was 65 when he opened this Zawaya, an age when most men retire. In 1971, this venerable scholarly saint still resided over his Zawaya. He now had reached his centenary and this would be his final year on earth. Michael said when he set out to write this short biography of Sayyid Umar Abdullah, it dawned on him that although 
he was his student for seven years from 1981 until his death. He actually knew very little about his life. Saidoma never talked about himself much. Whatever personal information he did share was to impart knowledge and wisdom. He was always in every moment teaching, not only by word, but by example. Finally, Michael researched and told the story of Sufi Abdullah, including uncovering 25 years of his earlier life that had been lost even to his family. Sufi Abdullah's teacher, after after he, uh, uh, you know, after the being in World War II and being a prisoner of war and escaping and uh, returning, his his uh, teacher instructed him to go to Britain and to devote himself to calling his countrymen back to God and his messenger. When he received this instruction, Sufi Abdullah was filled with self-doubt, saying, I'm only an ordinary person. How can I perform such an important task? His teacher and master, Zindapir, replied, you're doing God's work and God will help you. Dr. Mustafa Badawi tells the beautiful story of Habib Ahmed Mashur al-Haddad in quoting from one of Habib's discourses, all these perishable things, why were they called perishable? Money perishes, life perishes, oceans perish. They are all perishable and God has called it in the Quran, the life of this world is but play and amusement. Perishable things you play and amuse yourself with for a while and then after, either they leave you or you leave them. Sidi Hamza Yusuf tells the untold story of Sheikh Murabat al-Hajj, who in 1937 walked across Africa from Mauritania to, to Sudan, taking a boat to the Hejaz to perform the pilgrimage and visit God's, God's messenger in Medina. When he finished, he walked back across Africa to Mauritania. Sidi Hamza, commenting on his later years, for Murabat al-Hajj, the sacred monotony of his life was his daily practice, a constant working on his presence with God, because if one is present with God, one is present with, with his creation. Sidi Karim Laham explores the amazing life of Sayyidah Fatima al yushratiya whose father was a great sheikh in his own right. Sayyidah Fatima pleaded with Sheikh Abdullah al jaza one of her great teachers, to allow her to come to him given his age. His reply was characteristic of such men. He said that would never do, for even were I to be in India and you were to call for me, I would come to you walking. You are the daughter of my sheikh and spiritual guide to God. Glory be to him, the exalted. And finally, no, not the second to last, Sidi Sama Dijani explores the extraordinary life of Sheikh Sali al Jafri. Sheikh Sali was recognized by his contemporaries as having reached the highest levels of mastery and due disburance. Those attending his Friday lessons felt that his discourses were inspired. And finally, Shams Friedlander, despite his current ill health, managed to bring together the life of Muzaffar Ozak who lived during the period of Ataturk's rule in Turkey, when the Sufic tarikas and tekis were banned. Even the wearing of turbans and scarves were forbidden, but despite that, they kept the spiritual traditions alive behind locked doors. And although I've been um, doing this present presentation, I've never had the books. They finally arrived today. <laughs> and... Uh, we took possession of them. They came from Turkey and uh, we have some today. So you can actually buy, you can actually have the physical thing today. So um, it's, a, it's a nine box set.
Jazakallah khair and uh, Sidi Peter for a wonderful presentation and giving us a real insight into um, the men and women of God from different parts of the world. So we're very grateful to you. So now, everyone, we have a real opportunity to um, ask questions, make any comments, uh, to have a conversation. Um, so this is your chance. So what I'm going to try to do is maybe pass the mic around. Um, if anyone wants to ask a question or make a comment, just raise your hand. And as the mic's being passed around, then it can come to you. Um, the one thing I'll request is when the mic comes to you, please hold it close to your mouth so that um, the, the sound can um, sort of carry because the sound um, quality is not so good when the mic is far away. So, so over to the audience. Can, can I just say before anyone asks any questions, I have to, I have a bit of a disclaimer to read that I'm not, I'm not like the Pope or the Vatican claiming these people are saints. You know, the, there are many saints out there. These are just people that I met personally, and the people that we presented in exemplars are known, you know, scholars and sages in their own rights. But there are many, and uh, each of you, were you to do a search, would find your own teachers. There are many, many of them. But we needed to find also people that we who, to find people who knew their stories. Many, many saints and sages, people don't know their stories. And many of them had incredible, difficult lives, really. I mean, when you read about their lives, they did not have easy lives. You know, maybe we have an idea that saints, their life is so easy, it's, you know, they're in. It's, just, it's never like that. They have real struggles, personal struggles, family struggles. Sufi Abdullah was a prisoner of war. So, I mean, it, it's it's really important. You know, I'm not saying these are the only saints. There are many. These are just people that we've met. And uh, that's my disclaimer. <laughs> Right, okay, so we have a wonderful technical team here who are supporting this evening. We've got uh, Sidi Fahad and uh, Sidi Nawan. So what I'm going to request you to do is if you can project your voice and ask the question, <laughs> and what I'll try to do is capture that and repeat it on the mic so that Sidi Peter can hear it, but also the audience online, if that's okay. Do we have, do we have a wireless? Okay. What's that? Yeah. Okay. Stand around until it gets authenticated. Do you have a repeat? Sure, that's fine. Just a question. Sure. Assalamu alaikum. Thanks for coming down to our and honoring us. Sure, it's my pleasure. You were so close to me, I didn't even know you existed. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I'll have you more often, inshallah. Um, the picture that you took, taken of uh, Sheikh Murabat al Hajj. Um, what was the what was the story behind um you know his hand over his face i know he doesn't quite like his pictures being taken and things yeah, but yeah. maybe you could just tell a story about that because that's probably one of the most biggest <coughs> pictures that we've seen that's the most famous ones on the on the net um Sheikh Hamza came to me vis visiting me one time and this is in the days of vhs tapes right <laughs> he said he stuck it in my vh player and he said i want you to come and visit my teacher in mauritania and like it was a really bad video and I took one look at it and I said, yeah, I'm coming. And, uh, um, and he said, you know, I, I, I want you to take his picture. So we, we planned the trip. And it was, in those days, it was very difficult. I mean, I had to get to Mauritania for a start. And that, was, that wasn't easy. Even getting the visa and everything was extraordinary. But, um, and then it was like a 24-hour drive from Nwagshot to get to Twemere. Um, I wanted to go by camel, but they wouldn't let me. Um, and then, when I got when I got there at the at the camp, uh, I was introduced to Sheikh Murabat Tal Hajj, and uh, he asked my name, and um, they told him my name, and he was quiet. Now, the only way I can describe this is if, like, the CIA would, like, once they got their name, they go into their main frame, right, and check you out. But Sheikh, Sheikh Marab Hajj went somewhere in the unseen world, I don't know where. And so he asked my name again, and then he went, Nam, Nam, like he found my name or something. And then, 
And then he just made a very long dua for me. And to be honest, that was really the end of my relation. I don't speak Arabic. I couldn't have deep discussions about fiqh or Quran with him. That was, I got it all in that meeting. And then the rest of the time I just spent just looking at what was going on, watching him every day, just sitting with his students and, you know, praying. And, uh, you know, he in those days he only ever slept two hours every night. He only ever drank camel's milk. And the days passed and we still had not taken the picture. And I said, Shaykh Hamza, we're leaving in a couple of days. You need to ask Shaykh Marabit al-Hajj permission. So um, he asked. Now, he just told me this recently. He said, when I asked Sheikh Marabit al-Hajj about taking your picture, Sheikh Marabit al-Hajj said, Oh, the blame and she's on the show. And I said, well, thank God you didn't tell me that. I'd have run out the camp. And um, but then he said I spoke to him and told him that you know it was important to show people in the West how the traditional knowledge was 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 passed, and uh, and so we arranged to do the session. Now he wasn't posing for me at all. He was just doing what he did. He was just sitting with his students, and the way I explain it because you know in Twemeret there's. It's completely still. There's no noise at all. I mean, it's so quiet. And the sheikh was just sitting there with his students. And I was there taking the picture. And every time, and this is the days of proper film cameras. So every time I press the shutter, it's, to me, it seems so loud because it seems such an imposition onto what was actually happening there. And I just wanted the floor to open me up because I didn't want to disturb him. And, and that. But I just, the only thing I was able to do was, I thought, I have to do this. Because once he's gone, that traditional picture of the teacher and his student teaching in a traditional way, because they have their wooden boards where, you know, they've learned what they're learning, whether it's Quran or fiqh, and they've memorized it. And then they come and sit in front of the teacher and they recite it. And if they make a mistake, the teacher corrects them or he expands on whatever they're whatever they're studying so that's basically what I was doing and uh, I got through the session and uh, survived so <laughs> and to be to add to that um, when I was doing this I, I had no pictures of what he was like in his younger years and I met his son and I said uh, Shaq Abdul Rahman are there old passport photos anything of him when he was younger he said there's nothing you took the only pictures of him. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I think, you know, reflecting on what you've done, I'm, I'm very, very amazed at the opportunity that Allah has presented to you to pull together such a, a rich um, collection of very pious people. I'm, I was wondering, how did you feel at the conclusion of your project? And if you had the opportunity to, to do it again, what would you do differently? <laughs> um, yeah, inshallah, it's not the end of the project. I mean, this is an extension of what I've already done. Um, at one point, uh, Dr. Mustafa Badawi said, where are all the shayuk of Egypt? And I said, well, I'll do it in volume two, inshallah. He said, it took you 50 years to do volume one. How are you going to do volume two? But um, we've done exemplars now. And uh, Habib Ali said to me, there are all these hidden awliya in Egypt that I know of. Will you come and photograph them? I said, I'm ready. Bismillah. So inshallah, I will do that. And we'll share those pictures with you, inshallah. I think it's important for us to see their faces. They remind us. And at this time, to see these faces is very important. But they themselves would not say that because they are they are just signposts to God. It's they say it's not about them. And as I, you know, I said many of them have never been photographed before, and uh, their humility is unbelievable. And there's no ego with these people, which is very rare in this in this time we're living in. And there's zero judgment. That's one of the things about them. 
that when you sit in their company, they're not judging you, even though they may know everything about you. But the way Dr. Mustafa explained it to me is that they see you on a spiritual journey. And when they see you, they see you at a certain point on that journey. And they may see certain difficulties or whatever, and they will pray for those difficulties to be eased. And that, that's really the transaction. But they consider that they're just signposts to God. And that's and that's really their role, you know. And but we need them because of the, of who they are. So, as someone said to me, you can't just talk to Prince Charles; you have to go through his secretary, right? So that's it's the same process spiritually. There's someone at the back. Well, I think with these um, with these people, um, if you find somebody that you have a real connection with, and that's it's really important that you connect with somebody that you feel a connection with. Often they will give you uh, something to recite, uh, and many of them, Sidi Mum Habib had his beautiful weird, and uh, the Habib have. You know their own things, the ratib and the weird of the teeth and things. Normally, if uh, a sheikh gives you one of these things and tells you to recite it every day, you should do it because that's a way of you connecting with them. Uh, it was described to me as like making a telephone call every day to your teachers, and this is a way that we are connected. And and this is really important. We asked one of our teachers. How how do you know, you know, a true sheikh or a true teacher? He said, you could have the best iPhone in the world, but if you don't have a SIM card, you're not connected. And I like I think that's a great uh, mithal about uh, these things. And if you haven't got a teacher, then ask God to guide you to one. Um, I do believe it's really important. You know, the Quran didn't come down in a vacuum. It came with the Prophet Sallallahu You have the book and you have the man because you need to see the physical personification of what an enlightened being is, a human being is, and that's really important. But if you haven't got one, you're still fine. You have the teachings and you have everything, but then you ask God to guide you to someone that can help you on your journey, which is very important. They're like doctors of the heart. Because all of us have our own problems and issues that we need help with and guidance. And that's really, they're like, I call them spiritual doctors. Sidi Mamna Habib said the whole world is a hospital and the saints and the saints and sages are the doctors and the nurses. Sorry, I think I think you took the mic. Can you hear me? So you yeah, can you speak louder. Um, so firstly, Yeah. Okay. The first question is very difficult to me to answer because you, you've read the book. There's so many lessons, and from every person that I met, I learned something that was important for me. So I can't say there's one uh, single thing. There are many things. Um, the second question was, oh, who is my teacher? You have to read Meetings with Mountains to work it out. Mm -hmm. huh? You can't work out who my teacher is? <laughs> um, the first one was Sidi Mom Habib. And the second one was Habib Ahmed Mashur al Haddad. You have to work out who the third one is, I'm not telling you. 
No. I mean, he's one of my teachers, but... Uh, and the third question, oh yeah, Sheikh Nazim. I met Sheikh Nazim a long time ago in the 70s when I was part of a, a Muslim community living in London and he used to come and visit us. And, and that's how I got to know him. But I wasn't able to visit him in his later years, which is a pity. And uh, I didn't get to visit the amazing woman that's buried on the island of Cyprus. I can't remember her name, but Sheikh Hamza said it's very, very powerful. Yes. Yeah. Everybody says that she is amazing. And we, Hafsa and I, were listening to her, her story um, by uh, Omar Suleiman. It's an incredible story. Uh, amazing. Yeah. yeah. Sounds like we have a question from one of our online viewers. Yeah. Um, I have been struggling to find true and authentic Muslim role models to surround myself, as I've never had that growing up in the West. What advice would you give? Yeah, this is um, it's, it's one of the things um, that's in discussion more recently, that there have been certain teachers who have kind of fallen short uh, of what would be expected of them and um, when we spoke to uh, Muli Hashan he said this is an old problem you know teachers are they are human and they are human beings and they are fallible and if for some reason God shows you something about your teacher that you're ha not happy with then just leave i mean there's a habit now to people go online and start talking slandering and all this stuff but this is not our way really it's not our way and then you're accusing somebody of something and you're doing something that's just as bad if you see something just say nothing and just leave that's and then find someone god if god takes someone away from you he will give you something better and you have to believe that um it's a problem we're living in nowadays not just in in the spiritual world in all kinds of things you know we're living in a time of transparency but do your best ask god's guidance to 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 give you proper teachers um Sidi ali jamal said by knowing the false teachers of the path you will know the true teachers of the path so it's part of your journey and uh, don't worry about it too much um, and just keep looking and asking for guidance and God will show you then who the right people are. Yeah. I guess the role model for society right now, everyone's looking for like a sense of belonging. Yeah. And people feel quite sort of lonely and isolated and I guess part of maybe the path is that they they you know meet people in meet groups and feel like you know there's a connection. Yes. And so I guess like maybe we can help us think more about how do we really find that sort of true connection? How do we try to explore so that we're we're looking beyond that connection that we're looking beyond that you know looking for how we sort of think that we're drawn to all that. Yeah, I mean it, as I said, it's you know if the teacher is always not setting himself up you know it's, it's not about personalities it's really about somebody who is is basically almost invisible but who has a connection and who has wisdom and who studied and knows the science of how to teach and, and give spiritual help and guidance and things this is what you're looking for uh, I know people feel comfortable in all these groups and things, but sometimes your teacher, I mean, I, I was, I heard that there have been Satan and Satan, I think it was Satan and Noah had 10 followers, you know, in his 850 years life, you know, there were some prophets that didn't have any followers or one follower. So it doesn't mean you have to find a teacher who's got thousands of followers. It can be somebody who just has a small thing, but the, the, the most important thing is that you have a connection and I the only way I can describe it is those of you who are married that when you meet your wife or your partner you know who that person is 
you know they're your soulmate. It's very similar to that. It's a kind of recognition and an understanding that this this person is my teacher, and and that's as as much as advice as I can give about it because each of you are on your own journeys, and your teachers will be different and varied, but just just embark on the journey. That's the important thing, you know. I'm not a sheikh, by the way. I'm definitely not a sheikh. It, yeah, I mean, it's easy when you're in these groups to just sort of become very tunnel vision with, with the sheikh or the teacher. But the students are equally important. You learn from the students. You are, you learn from his followers as well, because in that group community, you're being taught all the time, whether it's from the sheikh or from other people. And and the nice good thing about being with fellow travelers is that you, you could be having a problem and you'll start talking to someone and find out they've gone through exactly the same problem that you're experienced. And so you get help that way. So there's always, in that group, I've always found this help coming to you all the time, you know. And uh, uh, it's a great blessing if you can find, uh, you know, a community that you connect with. But uh, it's uh, sometimes, you know, it may, it may be, as I said, small small numbers around some teachers. No, I do, because many of them are elderly. They don't have time to sit while I, you know, fuff around taking different, you know, sometimes I had like a few minutes with them. The thing about these people is that um, different to the selfie generation that we live, you know, in now where everyone, this is me in Paris in front of the Eiffel Tower. This is me in New York. And th these people are not putting on different faces. They are who they are. So in some ways, it's very easy to photograph them because they just, when they're in front of you, they are who they are. Um, for me, I always try and do my preparation beforehand. Like I would have measured the light. I would have found somewhere where the light is beautiful. And, you know, so I, I have to do my preparation before. So when the person sits in front of me, I'm prepared. And I do it as quick as possible. As I said, many of them, you know, uh, uh, Sheikh Mohammed Abbasi, who was on the front of uh, Meetings with Mountains, was 125 years old. Many of them in Meetings with Mountains were over 100 years old. And um, that doesn't say that they were, you know, didn't have energy. I mean, there was one man in um, who Hafsa and I went to meet in uh, Jeddah, he was 106 years old and he was running around the house getting us drinks and food. He had more energy than the three of us all together, you know, put together. And uh, during the meeting, he said to me, I'm going to live till I'm 111. And I was like, that's the first time anyone ever told me when they would die. And uh, I went back to Jeddah some years later and I met a student and his name came up and he said, oh, yeah, he just passed away. And I worked it out. Yeah, he was 111 when he died. You know, the man, Muhammad Ali, who was in the, in the presentation, the man that knew his astronomy, I asked him if I could take his picture, and he adopted that pose immediately. I didn't set him up or anything, and I just, like, I went, well, I just took a handful of pictures, and that was it, you know. Um, I was going to ask, is there anyone in the audience who has an interest in photography, wants to know more about it, you know, where to start, what to do? Do we have any budding photographers in the audience? Oh, we've got somewhere at the front. 
So we've got two. So yeah, any sort of comments or questions, anything you're curious about, you know, we've got, you know, a wonderful photographer here. So here's your opportunity to ask about photography as well. What kind of a uh, model of um <laughs> I've used um I've used Nikon's most of my life um and Hasselblad's in the um, mostly film cameras Hasselblad's and Nikon's and then the digital world happened and I continued to use uh Nikon's I couldn't afford the Hasselblads as they were way out of my league. Um, and But I was very unhappy with um, having used film for nearly 50 years. There's something about film. And I just didn't feel that digital really did it for me. I was very unhappy with it. Um, and I spent many years recently trying to find something that I was happy with. and. Uh, I kept telling my students, it doesn't matter what you use, just use an iPhone. I mean, it's just like, it's not the camera. And then I recently discovered that Hasselblad have made a, a digital camera, which is more like a, a reflex camera, but it has very large formats. It has a large uh, sensor in it. And I, they lent me one one weekend and I took one picture on it and I said, that's it. And uh, this is my dream camera. And, uh, it's, and I got I got it for this project, and uh, uh, I haven't really used it properly, but I'm starting to use it. It's a beautiful camera, really. They they worked. What I liked about it was the the technicians worked on the processing to make it look like film. So it has a film like quality. The color resolution is beautiful. It's got so much uh, depth in shadows and the highlights and stuff. It's it's really. But it's expensive. I'm sorry. I don't tell you, it's a very expensive piece of kit, but good technology always is, I'm afraid. But I like it because it's light. I've lugged around all this heavy equipment for years, which has broken my back, you know, and now I've got a camera that's light and very manageable. So, yeah. So I'm looking to doing all my next pictures of the Aulia on that camera. <laughs> He's a photographer. You should have loads of questions for me. Yeah. Well, I've done all types because I've traveled and I've done architectural and travel and culture and stuff. But I think now I really just want to get into portraiture. Portraiture is challenging for me because... I'm a kind of shy person, which is why I like to hide behind the camera, which is why I find this really uncomfortable. And I've managed to hide behind the camera for 50 years. But in portraiture, you need to engage with people to get the best out of them. And I think it will be challenging for me. But I just like the idea of having a one-to-one, -one, which is partly what Meetings from Mountains was about, is about having a one-to-one -one with somebody and capturing an image that really shows who they are. And I think, uh, inshallah, if God gives me time, I will just dive into doing portraiture, yeah. which is partly why I got that camera, because it's, it's for that, it's brilliant, yeah. Uh, there was one more question from uh, sure. viewers online. Um, over the many years uh, that you have traveled, uh, how common is it to come across Oliars in the Western world, i.e. UK and Europe? <laughs> That's a very good question. They definitely exist here. I mean, don't be... Don't just think they're in other countries. They're usually closer you, than you think. Um, <clears throat> being a photographer, I've learned to kind of sit and watch. You know, I do this exercise with students where we do workshops and I, I give them a project to do, go, go and photograph this thing, and I watch them all running around like headless chickens. And I say to them, no, you should just sit, just find somewhere and just sit still, sit very calmly. Watch your breathing, do some dicker, and then you will see pictures. Pictures will appear in front of you. And it's the same with Aulia. If you sit quietly in a place and just watch, see the people that no one else notices. Often I'll be in a hotel 
and I'll see people, usually they're serving other people, but they're kind of really anonymous, and you just think, you know, they spend their life in service. That's part of, of being one of the aulia, is serving people. And so you need to just learn to look and, and watch people. And often, I've had instances, even on a train going to London once, this man started talking to me. I didn't know who he was, but he was somebody special, really. He reminded my reminded me of my father. But this man, had a, he was English and he had a Muslim name. And afterwards, after we parted, I thought, who was that man? But he was very special. And sometimes these things happen, you know, but you have to be aware. Don't be too busy. Shekhamza said in Bradford, you know, we, we are born as human beings, not human doings. We're human beings. We have to be in our body, be present. This is what the sacred monotony that Sheikh Manabat al-Hajj talks about. And as I get older, the more I think about this, because old age is nothing about more than sacred monotony as your life slows down and you're doing the same things. I love it for me. Like I've spent a life being busy, you know, being a busy person. Those days when I just have a routine, it's like medicine for me, you know. <laughs> When I can get up in time, you know, before Fajr and all these things, which is difficult when you're traveling, right? But these are, this is what, this is the lives of the Aulia. When you're with them, they're going, is it time for the next prayer? You know, they're checking their, you know, oh, we're going, oh, we just missed it. Or we missed Asr, it was an hour ago. So they're like, is it time? You know, 10 minutes before time there, is it time? You know, this, this Sheikh Marabat al Hajj in his last years was just saying, kept asking, is it time for the next prayer? That's their main concern in life. Yes. I'm concerned. Uh, thank you. Um, was there any um, sense of shame? Did you, did you feel guilty about God? Did you feel like, oh, I wish I did? <laughs> and, uh, and did you think it was just a thing that you meant? Um, I'll answer the last question first. The first saint I met, Never forget, I've been in India, so I met gurus and, and um, you know, holy men. But Aulia in Islam are different. And the first person I met when I became a Muslim was Sidi Mom Habib. But when I did Hajj three months later, and we were expecting to meet Sidi Mom Habib on the Hajj, when we got to Mecca, we heard that he passed away on the way to. Mecca, but we were a group of seven English, uh, English and American Muslims. We met a, a small Pakistani man who was from Multan, and somehow he connected with us. And I'll never forget this man because in the middle of Hajj, when he did Tawaf, he had his hands on his chest like this, and he just, he just was reciting Salat and Nabay. And this was during Hajj, and no one bumped into him. There was always a space around him. And he was with us in Mecca. And then when I went to, when we went to Medina, I was uh, walking down a street. And I remember thinking to myself, why am I walking down this street? And I met this man again. And again, he joined our, spent time with us. And someone in our group had a dream that he was sent by the Prophet to look after us and his name was Guna Muhammad the servant of Muhammad and he was from Multan and I, I always wanted to go to Multan and meet him but I never had the chance and I finally went to Multan a few years ago of course he, he would have passed away by now and uh, all the pictures I took of him never came out yeah he was. He definitely was one of the hidden ones. Um, regarding, um, actually, nearly everybody that I wanted to photograph, I got to photograph. The only person, there had been some women that I would have loved to have photographed, and I couldn't. One of them was the um, the granddaughter of Habib Sali, who's buried on the island of Lamu, and after the Maulid, all the scholars and all the shayuk go and kiss the hand of the granddaughter of Habib Sali. And I watched this, 
and I knew I couldn't photograph. I wish, I wish that, but it's not in their culture for women to be photographed. But I regret that I couldn't show that because it showed the respect that the men had for this woman. And she was beyond male or female. There's something incredible. I can't, it's almost hard for me to describe about it, but she was a very spiritually evolved person. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you have to have permission and I think that was really important with the pictures I took that I had um permission, except for that lady that I described in the car. I took her picture and I didn't know who she was. I just saw her and I just took her picture and you can see she gave me such a look and I didn't know who she was and somebody asked me, a, a Pakistani a retired general, did you, did you meet anybody in Pakistan that was interesting? I said, there were two people I photographed in Multan. One was a man, I saw him in a tomb and the other one was this woman and he showed the pictures to someone and they were they confirmed that they were both hidden aulia of Multan and she disappeared after that after I took the picture and they say there are some hidden saints that if you expose them they have to move because their job is really is is being hidden they are not to be known and uh, so I have that on my conscience that I but you know it was just instinctually for me I saw her and I knew that she was somebody special Incredible woman, really, very strong woman. Yeah. Jazakallah khair. Can I just add, what, sorry, I just no. want to add one thing. We asked Habib Ali about, the, this is very important for the women. We asked Habib Ali about the, about female saints, and he said it's, it's exactly 50% men and 50% women. The men do not have the majority on this, but the women are much more hidden. And I think partly because of the time we're living in and how women are not respected in this society, which is why the women saints are hidden, but they do exist and they're accessible. And I advise all you women to, if you find them, to go and seek them out. Often even the wives of some of the shayuk, like Habib um, Hafsa met the wife of Habib Ahmed, she was a beautiful. And Habib Ahmed said that her doers were acceptable.